Julius Adolphus Jenkins' Christmas Alligator by Lewis Beck, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. When Mr. Julius Adolphus Jenkins arrived at the thriving little city of Townsville in North Queensland, he was, at first, greatly flattered at the amount of attention he attracted when he walked up Flinders Street to introduce himself to the manager of the Bank of North Australia, to which institution he had been appointed ledger-keeper. But when, in addition to being stared at by every passer-by, he found that people ran to their shop doors and either gazed at him in open-mouthed wonder or laughed outright, he began to feel annoyed and was glad to enter the bank to escape observation. The manager of the bank and his accountant were at that moment discussing the expected arrival of the new chum, Ledger Keeper, who was due that morning by the English mail steamer, and Mr. Jenkins thought it very strange and somewhat rude that they should stare at him as if he were some new species of animal. However, they were both very polite to him, inquired if he had had a pleasant voyage from London, and asked him what he would like to drink. This made Mr. Jenkins in turn stare at them, and wonder if these two disreputably clad young men were really the manager and accountant of a bank, or a couple of daring burglars who had taken possession of the building. I, uh, I, I thank you. I don't know, he stammered. Oh, but please do, Mr. Jenkins, said Alec McPherson, the manager, genially. Come into the dining-room. Shut the door, Jimmy. If anyone comes, let him knock. And he led the way into the dining-room, where Mrs. Flaherty, cook and general, was laying the table for lunch. Without being told, she went to the deal dresser that did duty as a sideboard and dinner wagon, and brought a bottle of brandy, a bottle of whiskey, some bottles of soda, and three large tumblers, and placed them on the table. Apologizing for the want of ice, a rare commodity in Townsville in those days, Mr. McPherson, on learning that Mr. Jenkins would take just a very little brandy, passed him the bottle, told him to help himself, and opened a bottle of soda water for him. Then he and the accountant, Jimmy Bathurst, locally known as Jimmy Bad Thirst, helped themselves to what Mr. Jenkins thought an appalling and disgraceful quantity of whiskey. "'Well, Mr. Jenkins,' said the manager, as he cocked one leg over the arm of his chair, and began cutting up a pipeful of black plug tobacco, "'we are glad to see you. Of course, you'll have lunch with us? That's right. Where are your traps?' Oh, at the Queen's Hotel. Well, it is about the decentest place in town to stay at. Bathurst and I live here, bank rule, you know, and we manage pretty well. Now then, Mrs. Flaherty, kindly hurry up and give us a good lunch, please. Hope you'll like Townsville, Mr. Jenkins. It's a beastly hot hole, but there are a lot of good fellows here, and you'll soon get into our ways." Mr. Julius Adolphus Jenkins murmured, in a dazed sort of way, that he hoped so, and then asked when he was to begin his duties. "'Oh, in about a week, if you like. There's no hurry, and I am not going to rush you into work at once. Don't you smoke? Of course your salary begins from today, but Jimmy here and the exchange clerk will attend to the ledgers for a week or so more with pleasure.' By the way, Jimmy, when is Fletcher coming back? Fletcher was the youthful exchange clerk. Bathurst grinned, when he does. You told him he could go fishing for an hour or two this morning. Dare sail he'll turn up tomorrow to call over. At lunch, McPherson and his subordinate did their best to put their guest at his ease, for they both saw that he was not at all happy. In fact, he really was miserable, 
for he felt that he had come to live among savages. Excusing himself as soon as possible, he went off to his hotel, and once he was out of hearing, the two young men burst out into irrepressible laughter, in which Mrs. Flaherty, unchecked, daringly joined, swaying, with her hands on her hips, from side to side, whilst tears rolled down her perspiring cheeks. "'Niver did I see such a thing like it in all me loif," she panted at last. "'Sure the whole town will be a for following him up and down the strait." "'Get away out of this, Mrs. Flaherty,' gasped Bathurst, as, with the tears streaming down his own cheeks, he pushed her out through the door just as a big bearded man in the uniform of an inspector of mounted police came in, and looked at the two young men, wondering what was the cause of their mirth. "'Closey, my boy, did you see it?' said Bathurst, in a choky sort of whisper, as he sank back in his seat. "'What is it?' asked the officer. "'Our new chum clerk from England just turned up. Oh, Closey, he's glorious! He's a wonderful sight! A circus, a panorama isn't in it with him. You must bring your nigger troopers to look at him. Such a rig-out for North Queensland you never saw in your life. Top hat, frock coat, collar half a foot high, monocle, spats on his boots, kid gloves, and a beautiful cane." "'When will he be on show?' inquired the hairy man, as he helped himself to a drink. Now Julius Adolphus, as he was henceforth to be known, although a terribly conceited young man and an intense admirer of himself, had a certain amount of common sense, and when he found that his Piccadilly costume attracted such widespread attention and amusement, he began to feel uncomfortable. It was not pleasant, for instance, when he showed himself in the street, to hear a lot of rough diggers make such remarks as, Oh, strike me, Dick, just look at it! Or for a great hulking bushman to deliberately stand in front of him open-mouthed, and then fall down in a pretended fit. He stood it for a few days, and then Macpherson came to his assistance and gave him advice. You. You see, Mr. Jenkins, your style of dress is so, so very unusual in this part of the world that it, well, it makes people stare. Now, I'm sure you won't mind my advising you to discard it for something more suitable and less striking. Do you wish me to discard wearing a coat? inquired Julius Adolphus hotly, adding with dignity that he would draw the line at that. Had Messrs. Macpherson and Bathurst seen the very descriptive letter which the young man wrote home to his parents, they would have at least been interested, if not flattered, at his remarks about the society of Townsville in general, and themselves in particular. The people are the roughest and dirtiest imaginable. One half of them are diggers who are swarming in from the interior on their way to the new gold fields on the Palmer River. They all have horses, use the most frightful language, and when not fighting or intoxicated, are lying asleep in the shade on public house verandas. When I first entered the door of the disgraceful building called a bank, I found therein two rough-looking young men clad in shirts, trousers, and boots socks, I presume, they had. Round each man's waist was a coarse leather belt, on which was also a greasy leather watch-pouch. Neither had collar nor tie, and each was smoking a pipe. Imagine my disgust when I found that these two disreputable-looking roughs were respectively the manager and accountant. Certainly they were civil, and I presume have been gentlemen, they addressed each other as Jimmy and Alec, and seemed to be on terms of the most shocking familiarity with their customers, and go out and have drinks with them at the low hotel opposite the bank at all times of the day, or invite them into their own dining-room, 
and this in banking hours. And they keep a pack of savage kangaroo dogs, which live in the bank. The exchange clerk is an unmitigated young ruffian of eighteen named Fletcher. He also smokes a pipe in the bank, and out of it, and addresses me as Jenkins, and is hail-fellow well met with the rough and dirty diggers and bushmen who come into the bank on business. I wonder what these three beautiful creatures would think of an English bank and its tone. Six months had passed, and Julius Adolphus had become used to, and not entirely averse to, his surroundings. One reason for this was that, being very musical, his evenings were not dull, and although Townsville was a new town, there was no lack of ladies' society, for nearly all the government officials, merchants, doctors, and other professional men were married, and some had families, in which were some pretty girls. And as Mr. Jenkins began to lose his provincial English stiffness, and wear white ducks, and unbend himself generally, he actually found that he was beginning to like some of the people who were always so hospitable to him, and for a Miss Mary Brandon, the pretty daughter of a leading merchant, he had more than a liking. Like himself, she was very musical, and he visited her father's town house on Melton Hill several evenings a week. Mary was at first much inclined to make fun of her admirer, and chaffed him a good deal, which only made him the more devoted to her, and as time went on he gradually lost much of his new chummishness, and mixed with young men of his own age, attended an occasional race-meeting, and even went so far as to join in a kangaroo hunt. But at the same time he always regarded himself as an infinitely superior person and he hated Jimmy bad thirst, first because that irresponsible young man openly expressed his admiration for Mary Brandon, and secondly because he was noisy in the bank, smoked incessantly, even when cashing checks over the counter, and always spoke of banking as merely a pawnbroking business, without the sign of the three balls over the door. Julius Adolphus had a holy reverence for banking as a dignified and gentlemanly pursuit, and it horrified him to hear loose talk like this. When the rainy season came in, there was a great wild-goose shooting party on some swamps a few hours' ride from the town, and he was induced to take part in it, clad in a wonderful sporting get-up, which caused great hilarity. Everything he wore from head to foot was new, and as every article, except a huge green-lined solar tope, had been made by local tailors and outfitters, who had never made the like before in their lives, but had done their best, which was awful to look at, he presented such a curious spectacle that numbers of the townspeople cheered him and almost every fourth person he met inquired if he was going far. Allusions to the solar tope were numerous as being just the thing to attract geese and ducks, and so on. But Julius Adolphus deigned no reply, and trotted along the street in dignified silence and chin in air. On his way to join the party, he called at Miss Brandon's house. She told him, out of pity, that he looked so nice and so different from the others, that he flushed with pleasure, and said he would leave a goose at the house on his way home. Arriving at the swamp at dusk, the party camped for the night in tents, intending to begin the shoot at dawn from three different sides of the great swamp and Julius Adolphus was instructed as to the position he was to take up at a certain spot, and not to fire till his turn came, or he would, as young Fletcher observed, spoil the bloomin' show. But he was determined to get more geese than any one. 
So long before dawn he started alone, got to his appointed post under a clump of fi trees, and waited impatiently. For all around him he could hear hundreds upon hundreds of geese, some on the banks, some on the water. And at the first break of day he saw on a little islet less than fifty yards away thirty or forty birds standing at the water's edge. In an instant he fired both barrels and uttered a shout of triumph as two birds dropped, and gun in hand he dashed into the shallow water and promptly sank up to his chin in mud, as some thousands of geese, with a noise of wings like a hurricane, rose in air from all parts of the swamp and made off to another spot, two miles away, amid the curses of the rest of the shooting party. Julius Adolphus was rescued just in time from perishing miserably. Then his gun was found, and he was brought back to camp, given some coffee, threatened with murder if he left the tent again, and the two geese he had shot thrown at him with much Queensland language. He waited till the party had gone, then burning with anger at his rude treatment, but proud of his skill, he caught and saddled his horse, and with the pair of geese made his way back to town to his hotel, changed his clothes, and at lunchtime carried the geese to his divinity. Her sweet words of praise filled his manly bosom with joy and before an hour had passed inspired him to confess his love. And whilst Mary did not actually say yes, she did not say no, but at the same time frankly told him that he must try and be less English, especially in his assumption that colonials were an uncultivated lot of beings and quite inferior in intelligence to the Englishman born. And Adolphus, she added, just show all these young fellows that you are as good a sportsman as any one of them. I know you can be, if you try. And Julius Adolphus Jenkins went home on air, blessing those two geese. For some weeks he preserved a distinctly haughty demeanor to Jimmy Bathurst and young Fletcher especially when the latter made rude allusions to the awful sight he had presented when pulled up out of the mud. He now paid the fair Mary daily visits, and promised her to learn to ride like a colonial, and not mind a little chaff. "'Every new chum gets teased at first, Julius,' she said. Now, Mr. McPherson was such a dandified young Scotsman when we first knew him ten years ago but look at him now. Anyone would think he had been born and bred in the bush, and lived among rough diggers and bushmen all his life. I don't want you to be careless or untidy in your dress, but would like you to be just a little more colonial in your ways. And I want you to go shooting and fishing and kangarooing as much as you can, like the other men here. And, oh, Julius, do try and shoot an alligator. There were five killed in Ross River last week by different people, and I should like you to shoot one. Could you not? It is not very dangerous, if you are careful. Julius bridled up. What they can do, I can do, he said loftily. Mary's eyes sparkled. Oh, Julius, do try! And if you do, I will marry you whenever you ask me. The fact is, Julius, dear, father laughs at you and says you are an awful duffer and teases me terribly about you, and that horrid little beast of a Fletcher boy mimics you so terribly, and you know what father is, he laughs at every one. But he won't let me marry a duffer, no, not if he were a duke or a bishop. A mile or two from Townsville, near the mouth of the Ross River, there was a small, muddy-banked and low mangrove island, in the center of which was a ramshackle hut 
raised on four piles. It was used by the local Chinese shrimpers and fishermen, and also by alligator shooters, occasionally, as a good and safe spot to get an easy shot at close range at any saurian lying on the river bank a few yards distant. Here, one afternoon at four o'clock, two days before Christmas Day, Julius Adolphus found himself determined to kill an alligator before nine on the following morning. He was due at the bank at ten. For the purpose, he had borrowed a heavy Terry police rifle, had had its mechanism explained, provided himself with twenty cartridges, some rope, and also some refreshment in case he had to remain the night. He had reached the islet by a punt belonging to the Chinaman, who lent it to him for the night for half a crown, under promise of his not losing it. This he failed to do, for immediately he jumped out of it, the thing shot off stern first, and went whirling down the muddy river and out to sea. This was disconcerting, for there was not a soul about. It was raining, and there were millions of mosquitoes stinging his face and hands. However, he was not alarmed, rather exhilarated, in fact, at spending the night alone, though the loss of the punt and the rope, the latter to secure the alligator after it was shot, was annoying. The floor of the hut was six feet above the ground, and all around the four rough posts, and also hanging from the floor beams, were folds upon folds of a stout fishing net put there to dry by the Chinaman. Ascent to the hut was by means of a notched pole, slanting upwards from the ground. The interior was bare of any furniture, but there were plenty of Chinese smells. The hut, although such a rickety-looking affair, was really strongly built, and every part of it, including the posts, were lashed together with cane instead of being fastened by nails. For two hours, till darkness came on, Julius Adolphus, rifle in hand, scanned the muddy banks opposite, but saw no sign of any alligators, although he was several times inclined to fire at some logs, which he had been told very much resembled alligators when those reptiles were asleep. He passed a wretched night. It poured with rain continuously, and as it wore on towards morning, he became conscious of an alarming fact. The river was rising fast. Striking a match, he peered down through an opening in the roughly boarded floor, and his heart sank when he saw that the yellow rushing water was within two feet of the boards. Then he went to the door, or rather entrance hole, of the now trembling shanty, and peered out. He could see nothing for the blinding rain obscured everything. For a moment or two wild terror possessed him, and seizing his heavy rifle, he fired shot after shot in quick succession through the doorway, in the hope it would bring succor. No answer came. There was only the hum, the low, droning hum of the rushing flood, as it swept through the mangroves, and the heavy plashing of the rain upon the pine-boarded roof of the humpy. Then Julius Adolphus Jenkins, the dude, the howling new chum, and the rank duffer, pulled himself together and became a man. He lit his pipe, Mary's doings, for he had abhorred smoking a pipe, sat down on the quivering floor of the humpy, and waited for daybreak. Dawn at last, and Julius heaved a sigh of relief when he saw that the water was lower by several inches, but the ramshackle structure was canted over to an alarming degree, although the post which upheld it had been planted several feet in the ground. Suddenly there arose a strange and violent commotion immediately beneath the floor of the hut which presently began to sway to and fro, then came shakings, 
followed by a succession of thumps and bumps against the posts, and the hut canted over more than ever, and then began to move, and the occupant realized that he was adrift and being carried down to the mouth of the river. Most fortunately, the posts did not become detached, and dragging along the bottom, helped to keep the hut in a fairly steady position, although every now and then it would be shaken in a most violent and extraordinary manner, and occasionally turned completely round. Knocking off some of the roofing, Julius thrust his head through, and shouted with all his strength as he saw through the blinding rain a group of woodcutter's huts on the bank. But no one heard him, and on went the humpy, shaking and bumping and swaying to and fro. As Julius continued to look about him, the rain suddenly ceased, and his heart leapt with joy when he saw that right ahead was a long, low point of land, and beyond that, and stretching across the river, several mangrove islets close together, and towards these the hut was drifting fast, and he determined that if it did not ground upon one of them, he would swim to the nearest to avoid being taken out to sea. Ten anxious minutes passed, and then the floating hut crashed into the trees on one of the islands, and stuck fast, but curiously enough, now began to shake and heave about more than ever. Satisfied that he was now safe, and that he would soon be seen, Julius clambered out on the roof and looked about him. No habitation was visible, but he could see some horses and cattle about a mile away on the left-hand bank of the river, and as the sudden flood was now subsiding very rapidly, he decided to wait a few hours where he was, instead of trying to swim across, whilst the current was so strong, and perhaps be carried out over the shallow bar, or be seized by an alligator. In an hour the water had fallen quite two feet and Julius was eating some sandwiches when he noticed that, although the hut did not shake as it did before, the net, some loose folds of which he could see beneath him, was every now and then agitated in a peculiar manner, and that the folds were being drawn in against, not flowing out with, the current. Clambering down the other side of the roof, he looked beneath the flooring which was now many feet above the water, and noticed, swathed round and round in the folds of the net, a huge something which certainly moved, and then a chill of horror passed through him as he saw the protruding forearm of an alligator. For a moment or two the sight unnerved him, and he trembled. Then, hardly knowing what he was doing, he climbed the roof again, got his rifle, and descended to the ground, fired shot after shot into the monster, and a savage delight filled his veins as he saw it writhe and quiver as each heavy bullet ploughed its way into his carcass. In a few minutes it lay quiet and dead. Half an hour later a party of Chinese fishermen appeared in a boat, and the exultant Julius Adolphus struck a bargain with them for a pound and ten shillings to bring the Saurian to Townsville. He accompanied them, and a little after noon they landed at the steamer wharf, and the giant reptile, one of the largest ever seen in North Queensland, was hoisted up by a steam winch amidst a scene of the greatest excitement and amongst the first to offer their sincere congratulations were Macpherson and Jimmy Badthirst. Followed by a cheering crowd, they marched to the Queen's Hotel, and there Julius Adolphus became the hero of the day, when, leaning his rifle against the bar, he called out, Come in, gentlemen, every one of you, and have as many drinks as you like. I am good for five sovereigns. A burst of applause greeted this welcome announcement, and the news spread like wildfire. Then the dead alligator was dragged by a pair of horses up to the hotel for exhibition, and Julius Adolphus' cup of happiness was full. 
McPherson took him aside. "Go and change your clothes, Jenkins," and added with a twinkle in his eye, "and don't bother about the bank to day." Julius Adolphus, inwardly blessing him, took himself off, and within an hour was with Mary Brandon. On the following morning the local herald contained an interesting item of news. We are happy to be in a position to state that Mr. Julius Adolphus Jenkins of the Bank of North Australia, the hero of a thrilling adventure with an alligator, narrated on page three, will shortly lead to the altar Miss Mary Brandon, daughter of W. S. Brandon, Esquire, J. P., of this city. End of Julius Adolphus Jenkins' Christmas Alligator by Lewis Beck Read by David Wales